Hello, welcome to Reality TV. I'm Raymond Vacari. Today I'm joined by former District 2 State Senator Juan Picardo, who is running for Providence City Council in Ward 9. The ward itself contains the neighborhoods of Elmwood and South Elmwood. Senator, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me, Ray. Thanks for coming on. It's great to have you on the show. My yeah. first question is a general one that you'll often get asked on the campaign trail. Why do you want to be Ward 9's next city councilor? Well, you know, Ray, um, as you know, that as you just mentioned, um, I was a state senator before, but uh, most importantly, when I came to Rhode Island and Providence, I've been passionate about my neighborhood, my city, and particularly uh, civic participation, being involved in different organizations uh, throughout the years and the, um, the years of service that I've had has been very remarkable, not, not only personally, but I think for our neighborhood. I decided a long time ago, along with my wife, Janet, we're very active in our community and we wanted to make sure that we were part of the solution. And uh, um, that's why I decided to step back uh, into um, running for office in particular here in uh, Ward 9, which is the Elmwood District. And, uh, and it's great uh, right here in, in South Providence. Before we dive into issues you plan to prioritize if elected, I know you spent, like you said, you spend quite some time in the General Assembly. This gives you an edge when it comes to experience if elected to the council and you have an idea of uh, what the state can do to help the city of Providence. If there was uh, one piece of legislation that the General Assembly could pass that would help Providence, what's one that comes to mind? Well, I think that um, one piece of legislation is that um, I think that uh, uh, the more funding for schools to support our youth and, and uh, and the education outcomes uh, for the youth in Providence. Because um, as you know, um, even before, and, and I believe, strongly believe now, uh, the youth are our, our future. You know, at one time I was a student uh, at Gilbert Stewart. I was a student at Mount Pleasant and Rhode Island College. So here we are sitting, um, being part of the, the solution in, the, in our great city and in our neighborhoods. So I think uh, uh, looking at the educational formula would be uh, a tremendous help for the schools in, in, in Providence, but also throughout the state. Um, and, and overall, having a, a, an informed and educated, educated uh, uh, citizenship, and particularly when it comes to youth, uh, will reduce a lot of the, um, the effects that we have that we're living through, whether it's uh, 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 violence and also making sure that uh, we have enough uh, opportunities for them uh, as they graduate from, from high school and on to college. Creating more affordable housing is one issue you plan to focus on as a city councilor. It's a hot button issue affecting the whole city and even the state too, for that matter. There are a few ways candidates on the show have mentioned how they would tackle this housing crisis. As a city councilor, which ideas would you support to help uh, tackle the housing crisis? Yeah, I uh, strongly believe that uh, we have and we need um, affordable, low income housing, but also to make sure that we have quality housing. Um, for our residents. I will make sure that, uh, uh, as I did when I was a, a legislator, fight for uh, more funding for, for, for housing, and affo especially for affordable housing. I wanna make sure that uh, when I'm in the, uh, and when I get elected, I, I fight for um, more funding for uh, affordable housing and making sure that uh, people have a voice uh, on how these developments are being uh, developed, it's particularly when it comes down to uh, making sure that if, if more development, private development comes to uh, Providence, that there's a voice uh, that not only is it affordable, but also that is, uh, it's sustainable for our communities and for people to remain in, in their neighborhoods. And while we're talking about affordable housing, we can't forget what's going on with the plans to rehabilitate the Superman building in downtown Providence. There is su supposed to be some of the house uh, apartments in that building is gonna be earmarked as affordable. But when the numbers have been crunched, some say, is it really affordable? And there are, uh, there's another crowd where they're just happy this building's finally being rehabilitated. Uh, what, were, what, were your, what were your thoughts on the plans for the Superman building? Well, first of all, I think that is an important landmark uh, that for, for Providence and even Rhode Island. So I'm very happy to see that the dialogue has continued and also that it's going to be rehab. You know, Affordable means to a lot of people means uh, uh, different things and different numbers, right? Um, so I want to make sure that affordable means that uh, people from even my ward uh, and the diverse community, and particularly when it comes to income, they can afford it. Again, uh, looking at those numbers, making sure that uh, 
not only are we expanding those numbers, but also does it really work for our communities? And, and, and so that way we can uh, collaborate, but also to be able to allow people to live in mixed communities, not just only by, based on, on cultural, but also on economics. And that we all can feel that we can live to uh, with each other, next to each other, whether it's a police officer, whether it's a banker, whether it's a, a social worker, whether it's someone that's working at your local you know, um, Walmart, because at the end of the day, uh, we all have to live in our city and we enjoy our city and we want to make sure that it's livable and sustainable when it comes to um, having a place to live. Education is another priority of yours. I, earlier on, you talked about the, the funding formula. I want to talk about charter schools for a moment. There's a debate about what role they should have in the city of Providence. Uh, parents are in favor of them, but then there's the crowd that says they take resources away from the public schools. Uh, and also they're not unionized for, for some of them. And um, that's creating this uh, hot button issue in city politics right now when it comes to education. What kind of role do you personally believe charter schools should have in Providence? Should there be more? Should there be less? Well, you know, I I've, have experience in, in dealing with and voting uh, on the issues of education. You know, as a city councilor, I will be at the table to make sure that it's a balance and that uh, our, the, the, the main point with all this is that our kids are getting a quality education. I want to make sure that the funding is there so that teachers get paid well, but also that the outcomes are, are the right ones and that we increase uh, the, the, the graduation rate versus these dropout rates. At the end of the day, I think that uh, we're all fighting for the same thing in terms of uh, making sure that our kids get a better education. And as a city council in Ward 9 and uh, one out of 15, I would be a strong voice uh, to ensure that we get the right funding for that, but also supporting our teachers and our, and our neighborhoods. There was a, a plan on the state on the state level to put a moratorium where I believe it was for three years there wouldn't be any new charter schools developed. Uh, would you support any moratorium? It sounds like you're in favor of a healthy balance in the middle. I I've, I uh, believe in in a healthy balance. I believe that uh, you know at the end of the day we we have to make sure that we are held accountable, and so these educational institutions, just like the public schools, are held uh, accountable to ensure that. Our kids are getting uh, the right education and that we're graduating our kids um, in the right path. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we need to make sure that we are uh, evaluating, you know, whether it's the uh, private uh, charter school in, in a, a one category and at the same time also the public schools. But we have to have those same standards to ensure that our young people are getting the quality education and that, uh, that they have a brighter future are uh, going on to college or a technical school because you know at the end of the day it doesn't guarantee that you are going to be successful with a college degree but if you have the work ethics you're smart and and along the line when you're a young person and you're 29 you decide to go back to school you have the foundation and you have the great school and that's what I thrive for um, not only for uh, in the city of Providence but also throughout the state. Looking at another part of the city's uh, education system, the public schools are under state control. The state takeover was uh, supposed to end in 2025. It looks like um, Commissioner Infante Green wants that to be pushed back another two years because uh, some of the setbacks that COVID had brought up, brought upon uh, the everything going on with education, you know, when it comes to absenteeism and all that. Do you agree with this decision or should the state uh, give the control back as, as soon as possible? You know, I, I think, uh, you know, being, uh, a product of the private school system and also being part of the processes over the years and seeing over six, seven uh, superintendents go through uh, our school system and also uh, me attending the public schools uh, hearings and uh, school board meetings and, and being a legislator. You know, I was in favor of, of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of the state taking over of our public school system because, you know, at the end of the day, we were not getting the outcomes that the, our future de demanded. So I, I support that. I support that, you know, the fact that, it, that the pandemic um, took a toll on many of us, and particularly when it comes to young people. You know, I have, a, I have young children, so I know the, the kind of effects that it took over the time where it became pretty much staying home and doing these Zoom uh, interviews. Now, young people at times are, are very hesitant to be social. So we need to make sure that uh, the emotional support is there. 
the, the, that they feel comfortable uh, getting back into quote unquote normal, uh, right? Because your normal uh, and young people's normal is now is not my real normal. But I think that we need to go back to make sure that they get the support academically, uh, mentally. You know, I like to say that it's, it's, it's the brain power. It shifts, you know, and we get accustomed to things. So I want to make sure that um, the state addresses some of those issues. And I think that perhaps uh, we should continue to have the dialogue of when it's appropriate for the state to and the city to receive uh, the school department back. Uh, one thing for sure is that when I'm a uh, city council, uh, we will have these discussions and we wanna make sure that we as parents at the local level, in the ward and in the city, that uh, we're at the table to make sure that we're ready for uh, to receive our schools, that the school board is, is very integrated and we have a, a real plan uh, and the right funding to make sure that our kids are successful and that our teachers are supported. Creating safer neighborhoods is also on your list of priorities as is education and uh, creating more affordable housing. Uh, this often then leads to the discussion of how public safety should look in Providence. It's one that's worthy of an interview itself, but to simplify the whole topic, it boils down to two main crowds, the defund the police slash reimagine public safety or the make reforms like increase training, mandatory body cams and bring back more community policing. Sometimes they intertwine a bit. But um, which direction do you personally believe the city should go in when it comes to public safety? Yeah, you know, public safety is is a, a top priority for for us here in Ward Nine. Um, I've lived it. I, I live here in the neighborhood, and is a concern, right? So we want to make sure that our police officers are well trained, are, are culturally sensitive, uh, understand our our communities. I want to make sure that we, as a community and as a city council person, um, that we continue to expand on the funding to make sure that they get the right training, that we, that we work in collaboration with uh, the support services that are needed in our community, whether it's a, a resource officer or a resource person along with a police officer. I think it's important. Um, I think that uh, the, the police uh, have a tough job and I respect that. You know, uh, I wanna make sure that they also understand that our city is so dynamic and that we have so many um, cultural diverse people in our city, and especially during the summer uh, where it swells, right? Because it becomes a tourist uh, destination. So we wanna make sure that we have enough police officer to take care of uh, the downtown and the tourist area, but also to keep us safe in our neighborhoods and that they're able to respond to uh, the necessities of our constituents when it comes to um, quality of life issues uh, within the neighborhood. Would you support any allocation of money from the police budget to another area that would say have a mental health worker respond to a certain um, situation that a police officer might not be necessary in responding to? Yeah, I think that uh, when we look at budgets, I think we, we have to set priorities, right? And I think that we can find uh, additional funds to ensure that we can support uh, those services that, that are needed within our, within, within our city, right? And that uh, not necessarily take away from uh, the uh, police and public safety, but finding those resources. Because I think that, you know, when you look at the, the police force, for example, you know, at times, you know, we may not have the, the, the amount of, of police that, that is needed when, it, when a population in our city swells, for example, in the summer. You know, there are months that when we look at the data, it, it goes down, the crime rate goes down and, and the response uh, goes down. But immediately when something, um, it happens tragically. Um, we need to make sure that we are safe and that we that that our city is providing those type of safety uh, protocols and response to our constituents, and the residents in the city of Providence. While we're still talking about public safety, the conversation around what should happen with Leobor, for those watching, that's an acronym for the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. I know this is sort of decided by the state, but you, you were in the General Assembly at one point. Uh, do you think Leobor should be repealed, reformed, or stay the same? You know, I, I think that the, the dialogue continues to, to take place. I think that uh, it, it's a healthy conversation. I think that uh, all of us, we, we live in, in, a, in a city, in a state, in a country that that uh, enjoys the freedom of, of, of speech and freedom of rights, but we also got to make sure that uh, protections and also uh, the rights of people are not violated. And I think those, um, those things need to be looked at and have continued to have a conversation. 
I think law enforcement um, have a tough and difficult job. Uh, I think that we as residents in the city of Providence have a very delicate um, a, a city. Uh, and at times, you know, things happen in different neighborhoods and we wanna make sure that they're responding the appropriate way, that they're sensitive to, uh, to the needs of the communities and its people. And that's what I'm about to make sure that they receive the, the resources. So that way at the end, um, we, we, we reduce these type of inc uh, incidents or at the same time that uh, we feel um, totally safe in our neighborhoods and our city. I understand the, the calls for the discussions, but in terms of Leobor itself, would you support a repeal reform or keeping it the same? It sounds like you're a little undecided yeah. on that. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm still, you know, I would like to have the continued dialogue uh, to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, voices are expressed. You know, as I continue to um, uh, talk to my constituents here and listen to them, um, I wanna make sure that, that uh, I convey their, their, their also uh, their thoughts and also uh, to be able to analyze the data and information as, as I'm receiving it. You know, I'm starting, um, I'll continue when I start to, to walk and, and door knock. I wanna make sure that I'm listening to them. I wanna make sure that uh, over the years, my experience has been is like, you know, listen to understand. That's one thing that I, that I want to continue to, to apply. And uh, as a city council, I wanna make sure that I walk uh, the district, I will listen to them, but also engage them in that process when it comes to making uh, uh, wider, uh, wider decisions that impact not just only the city, but also the state. This next one's more specific to Ward 9. Uh, Roger Williams Park is in the ward. Uh, this is one uh, topic that I talked about with uh, another Ward 9 candidate, and I want to get your, your take on. There is room for someone to introduce a long-term plan for the park, whether it's Come when, when, whether it comes to investments needed or even how to utilize the park to its fullest potential. Uh, it could be done in multiple ways. In your opinion, what investments could be made and how can the city, city utilize this park to its fullest potential? Yeah, you know, uh, I like to say that uh, Roger Williams Park is my backyard because I live uh, pretty much uh, literally uh, about uh, 10 blocks from here, right? And uh, I find myself, uh, since I arrived here in Providence in in 1979, riding my bike through the park. And, and over the years, I've seen the improvement. And I want to thank, uh, you know, Ryland Foundation for, for really uh, taking uh, the initiative and, and really improving our parks because it has become, and it, and it was, but now more so, it has become a, a, a renowned park. And every time I walk through the district, I learn more because they, they're preserving and cleaning the water. They're actually uh, implementing things that, that will, that we all can learn from, in particular when we walk uh, the neighborhoods, but also in the park of how to um, pretty much divert the water before it gets into the pond, before it gets into, into our rivers. I think uh, uh, the, the Ride Winners Park is a gem in our, in our state, in our city. And, and I'm proud to say that it's my backyard and hopefully uh, the voters will select me as a city council and that I can really uh, represent it and I think that the funding for a park and maintaining it um, and creating a, a, a fund that, that uh, continues to improve that park, it's, it's pretty amazing uh, the quality of life that we are going to continue to enjoy in Ward 9, but also the whole city and the whole state. It really is a gem in the ward and there's so much going on there. I actually had gotten my senior photos taken there when I was uh, graduating from high school. These next couple are uh, shorter form questions I like to ask to every council candidate. Do you have a certain committee you would like to be on if elected? Yeah, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the committee on, on uh, finance is, is a committee of interest because I think um, when we look at the education, when we look at uh, the funding um, and advocating for, for uh, the funding for education, for um, neighborhoods economic development. I'm a big proponent of supporting the micro businesses, those self-entrepreneurs, and also, you know, on Emwood Avenue and Broad Street, you look at just only, there's only one or two people working in, in these uh, uh, bodegas or stores, right? Um, on a larger scale, I think it's important uh, committee. I like to uh, see how I could also participate in uh, public works because I know how it is, uh, the quality of life in our community. Uh, when you walk out the, the your house or you're walking down the street, we want to make sure that that are safe, that are safe, but also that are clean. I want to make sure that uh, we stay on top of that. And, and I think that uh, uh, as I go along, um, uh, talking to my colleagues and talking to my constituents, 
they're going to, I'm going to be asking them, you know, what do you think if you know about city services, uh, about how I could represent? Um, I think that the third one I, I will leave out uh, for my constituents to, to give me some hint of, of how I could serve them. There is also a mayoral election going on. Uh, this is going to be decided in the September primary since there's no Republicans or independents running. There are three candidates, uh, Ward 3 City Councilwoman Nerva LaFortune, Brett Smiley, who worked for Governor Raimondo and uh, Mayor Lorza briefly, and uh, Gonzalo Cuervo. He was uh, Secretary of State Nelly Gorbea's Deputy Secretary of State. He also worked in a couple mayoral administrations here in Providence. Which of those uh, three candidates do you plan to support? Yeah, you know, for me, uh, I'm staying focused on my campaign. I, I am blessed that I know all three of them from uh, 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 Nerva La, La Fortune. I actually uh, have had the privilege to sit down with her and talk about issues when, uh, when she's, she's a current city council person. She's uh, dynamic and really intelligent. I was I had the privilege of uh, swearing her in when, uh, when she got elected. Uh, in addition to uh, Brett Smiley and Gonzalo. Gonzalo, I've known uh, over the years, I mean, uh, decades, uh, when, he, when we were doing the Dominican Festival on Broad Street and, 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 and just being leaders in, the, in our community, respective community. Brett Smiley, when he became uh, a, the campaign manager for uh, Lieutenant Governor Charlie Fogarty, and then uh, working in the city and, and at the same time as an advocate and also um, with, Rina, uh, with uh, Gina Raimondo. So three qualified people. I think the, the, the choices for the city of Providence is going to be challenging. I think that they have to uh, make sure that they they read everything that they get, but they have three great choices. And I, I look forward to working with either of them. And come uh, September, I, I can support either of them. And, and uh, But my, my main focus is to make sure that I cross that line on September 13 and get elected and getting the trust of my voters in Ward 9 and hopefully um, their vote on September 13. So it sounds like there won't be an endorsement before the primary? It sounds like that too, because I'm focusing on on my campaign, I want to make sure that uh, um, I focus on uh, connecting with my constituents, and and uh, also, you know, uh, uh, at the end of the day, they uh, their friends, the people that I know, they will they invited to come to my uh, my events and my fundraisers, and and uh, I want to may be able to uh, have my constituents meet them and uh, make their choice. Shifting to the non-political topics, you attended Rhode Island College, and I always like to ask this to uh, Rick alumni. What was your time like as a Rick student? Yeah, you know, I had the uh, the privilege of uh, attending uh, first a uh, community college of Rhode Island, CCRI, which was great. Um, and then I joined the military and uh, obtained an associate's degree from both um, community college of the uh, CCRI and community college of, uh, of the Air Force. And then as an adult, I, I attended Rhode Island College. And you know, for me, I didn't have the traditional uh, um, living at, in college and, and really, but I was a commuter. Rhode Island College is a wonderful college, it's a smaller college, but it's also so so uh, local and so close that my, my experience was very positive with the class sizes. You know, I remember uh, Professor uh, Lisi's, my political science uh, uh, mentor and also uh, advisor that, uh, the classes were pretty much like 15, 18 people and, and even smaller than that, but also to have the ability to, to um, interact with my professors instead of being a, in a larger university. Uh, so it was very positive during those times and I really enjoyed it. It's absolutely an amazing school and that is true. The class sizes are smaller than you, you it's hard, it's a, unlikely you'll have that big lecture hall with 200 people and it's great because you get the chance to interact with your professors like you had uh, like you had mentioned my final Sorry. question is also a non-political topic it's one i ask everyone on the show to keep to to keep the tradition and that is in your opinion what do you think Rhode Island is best known for well you know i, I love to go to uh iggy's so uh, the, the the clam chowder and and also uh, you know just the being around the coast is it's amazing you know my my friends that I that I that come and visit. Um, I always have to stop by Iggy, so that's a, a, a plate and a delicious food that uh, you know that, that that we're known for, right? At Iggy's, you could get the calamaris, the the clam chowder, and also uh, the clam bake. So uh, that's what Rhode Island uh, is known for, and I love it. Eggies is the spot to be, especially the summer. It, it's it's really good. I, I actually haven't tried the clam chowder yet, but I'm I'm, I'm actually going to plan to do that this summer. Uh, Senator, Absolutely. I, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure of mine to have you on. 
Well, thank you for having me and I wish you continued success on your program. I think that uh, as an alumni from, from Rhode Island College, you are on the right track. You know, you, you're, as we used to say when you were younger, uh, uh, you, were, you were the future and you are the future now. And especially now in the, in the space of uh, social media and, and having your own channel, it's worldwide. So I appreciate uh, the interview and I hope uh, that we can have another one uh, in the near future. Absolutely. You're always welcome back on. And thank you for that. That means a lot. Thank you for watching this episode of Reality TV. If you want to see future episodes as soon as they're posted on this channel, please click the subscribe button down below and the post notification bell icon to the right of it. I'm Raymond Bukhari. I'll see you on the next episode.